Chapter 6, Stalin. I suppose it's only fitting for a revolutionary to keel over and die at the completion of their lifelong mission, just like salmon. In a bit of good news for Russia, Vladimir Lenin fell deathly ill the moment he attained the apex of his power. In a bit of bad news for Russia, that power would be transferred to an even craftier, even shrewder, and possibly more pitiless communist despot. But which one? To most observers, Leon Trotsky was the obvious choice. This polished, sophisticated, urbane lunatic had been Lenin's right-hand man throughout the revolution and was probably the most visible communist in the world besides Lenin himself. Still, there were other candidates. Grigory Zinoviev was a prominent intellectual who had tried unsuccessfully to export the revolution to Germany. <laughs> Lev Kamenev was another ambitious would-be statesman and brother-in-law to Trotsky. There was also Nikolai Bukharin, who had led the revolution in Moscow. Felix Dzhinsky, the head of the Cheka. Mikhail Kalinin, the titular head of state. All these men regarded themselves eminently qualified to assume Lenin's mantle, and none felt too threatened by Lenin's short, stocky, not particularly charismatic party secretary, Joseph Stalin. After all, when has a secretary ever hurt anyone? You made me very happy. I hope you're happy too. Do I look happy? Like Napoleon, who wasn't French, Stalin was not Russian. Rather, he was born in Georgia. Uh, no, no, not that Georgia, this Georgia. And was in his early years destined for the priesthood. But once the Marxist parasite chewed through his choir boy mind, he gave up on Christianity and became a revolutionary, first making a name for himself with a daring heist of the State Bank of Georgia. At some point, he changed his name to Stalin, which means man of steel in Russian and probably indicates he either read too many comic books as a child or watched too much pornography. Historians remain divided. As a man, Stalin was tough, capable, subtly intelligent, but also profoundly devious and unnaturally cold-blooded. If Lenin and Trotsky brought the fire to the revolution, the blazing inferno that burned the old world away and left nothing but ashes, then Stalin brought the cold, cruel, inescapable darkness. He was the great shadow that would soon descend upon Russia, shrouding that vast, ancient country in an impenetrable veil of secrecy. What he lacked in personal magnetism, Stalin made up for with ruthless bureaucratic efficiency. Despite holding no government position, Stalin, as party secretary, was propitiously situated to promote up-and-comers loyal to him personally. Men such as Vyacheslav Molotov, Clement Voroshilov, and name unpronounceable. In this manner, Stalin slowly, carefully, and quietly built an immensely powerful political machine right under Lenin's nose. Underestimated by everyone, including Trotsky, nobody suspected what he was up to until it was too late. In 1923, with Lenin on his deathbed, Stalin schemed with Zinoviev and Kamenev to isolate Trotsky from the leadership. Their triumvirate, or Troika, was a masterclass in intrigue and deception. Trotsky, the forever revolutionary, was totally outwitted by this wily Georgian, <laughs> whose cunning knew no bounds. In January 1924, Lenin finally died. His lackeys then threw an elaborate state funeral for him, all except for Trotsky, because Stalin gave him the wrong date. And not for any calculated reason, just to be a dick. For some reason, the communists also found it necessary to remove Lenin's brain and mummify his corpse. They encased his remains in a glass coffin, which you can go and visit to this very day if you ever wanted to. There's also a gift shop that sells a variety of Lenin-themed merchandise, and for an extra 500 rubles, you can get your picture taken with Lenin in a pose of your choice. <sighs> with Lenin gone, Trotsky's influence steadily waned. He was stripped of all official appointments and exiled to Turkey in 1929. He bumped around several European countries for a while before finally landing in Mexico City, where he had an affair with Frida Kahlo. Really? 
No shit. But in 1940, Stalin's goons at last caught up with him and famously stuck an ice pick through his forehead. Good riddance, I say, to bad rubbish. Fuck you! Zinoviev and Kamenev, each of whom thought they could control Stalin, realized to their horror he had outmaneuvered them, and by 1925, they were out of the picture too. Sidelined for now, but later swept up in the great purges where they died, likely faced out on hard, frozen ground, covered in their own feces. Stalin's greatest gift lay in discovering, before anyone else, that in this new Soviet world there were no such things as friends, only temporary partners and future enemies. And it was always better to err on the side of caution than be blindsided yourself. By 1925, Stalin's cold, clammy grip on Russia was more secure than any czar or khan or king to come before him. A story goes that once during a meeting, Stalin mistakenly called some committee member by the wrong name, which prompted the man to immediately run out and change his name to whatever it was Stalin called him. Because everybody knew Comrade Stalin cannot be wrong. Unlike the old Bolsheviks who revered Lenin as some sort of Christ-like figure, the new Bolsheviks groveled before Stalin as if he were an ancient Sumerian deity. Are you a god? And in a sense, he was. At the snap of his fingers, he could make whole villages disappear, and at another snap, build ridiculous industrial cities in the middle of nowhere. Like this one, Magnogorsk. The Soviet Union's answer to Gary, Indiana. More than any other man, Stalin was responsible for engineering the Soviet Union into existence. How did that happen? Well, back in 1918, Lenin declared that all states of the former Russian Empire could freely secede. These would be places like Ukraine, Belarus, and the Stands. However, covert communist parties were set up in all these countries, and a few years later, Stalin bundled them back together into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. With the stroke of a pen, the Russian Empire was back in business. But just because Uncle Joe was cagier than his revolutionary pals, doesn't mean he was any less of a committed Marxist. His great contribution to the evolving Marxist religion was to abandon the perpetual world revolution idea in favor of building socialism in one country. In order to do so, Stalin would brutally impose one disastrous five-year plan after another, and neither he nor anyone else cared very much if the results were horrifying. After all, there would always be somebody else to blame. Chapter 6, Appendix A the liquidation of the Kulaks. Just how idiotic is socialism in practice? Well, sit tight. In 1928, Stalin accelerated the transition to collectivized farms under the assumption that farmers are more productive when they're driven from their ancestral homes, forced to live in dilapidated communes, and denied any ability to profit from their labors. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, year after year, crop yields plunged. To make matters worse, the majority of food was, again, either exported or prioritized for factory workers, leaving the peasants continuously on the edge of yet another famine. But of course, Stalin had a handy scapegoat in mind, the kulaks. Now, what is a kulak? Well, the word originally referred to any somewhat well-off peasant. Say a man with an extra dairy cow or something. But soon a kulak could mean anyone the Soviets decided was a kulak any time they felt like deciding. Were you good at your job? Well, you just might be a kulak. Were you bad at your job? You could be a kulak too. Was your father a kulak? Well, you're definitely a kulak. Did you kill a kulak and take his stuff? Aha, just what a kulak would say. Wait, there's more. In the collective farms, the Soviets promoted a theory called Lysenkoism. This was the Marxist idea that crops, just like people, grow best when they are planted in tightly packed collectives. 
Never mind this absurd notion flew in the face of thousands of years of agricultural know-how. This is what the collective farmers were forced to do. The seeds, planted too close to one another, cannibalized each other's nutrients and failed to take root. <laughs> In 1932, a scant ten years after the last one, another famine of biblical proportions swept through Russia. To meet this crisis, Stalin ordered grain and livestock pillaged from Ukraine. Under the justification that the Ukrainians were not genuinely enthusiastic about socialism and could therefore be deprioritized, in yet another chilling euphemism. From 1932 to 1933, this deprioritization resulted in the deaths of between 7 and 10 million Ukrainians. However, because the Ukrainians merely starved to death, or perhaps because all this happened within Soviet borders, the Holodomor, as it became known, has not acquired quite the same odium of that other, far more infamous genocide. And genocide is plainly what it was. Like Lenin, Stalin pointedly refused all international relief efforts and, unlike Lenin, never reneged on it. In his view, the Ukrainians were due for a correction. He had not forgotten that many Ukrainians had supported the whites during the Civil War, and his diabolic paranoia prevented him from looking past the mildest reports of Ukrainian nationalism. Any wonder why Ukraine hates and fears Russia to this very day? Who can blame them? Now, you might think that Stalin had better luck turning Russian industry around, and uh, you'd be right, actually. But how? Remember, all those skilled Russian workers or engineers had either been slain or driven into exile. So, what was Stalin's solution? Well, under the greatest of secrecy, the Soviets began hiring ringers. That is, industrial experts from the West to design and guide the construction of numerous large state-of-the-art factories. Once again, capitalism had ridden to the rescue of socialism. I guess somewhere in Marx it says that in case any of this shit doesn't pan out, just cheat and then lie about it. Uh, naturally, great care was taken to conceal from these Westerners the extent of the repression occurring within the wider Soviet Union. They even went so far as to construct artificial towns, called Potemkin villages, named after one of Kathy's old lovers, <laughs> intended to deceive Western visitors into believing the Soviet Union was some kind of fantastical Garden of Eden. It sounds laughable until you realize that much of the time, it worked. Famously, Walter Durante of the New York Times won the Pulitzer for his reporting on the Soviet Union, in which he claimed, among other things, that the Ukrainian famine was a scare story instigated by troublesome British and American journalists. This was in 1933, and again, his work was printed in the New York Times. The failing New York Times, which is like so bad. Chapter 6, Appendix B, A Timeline of Barbarity. Stalin's forced industrialization did gradually yield results, but at a tremendous cost in lives and the slow corruption of the Russian soul. Russian art, music, and cinema, which had briefly flourished at the start of the revolution, rapidly degenerated as the soulless Soviet machinery exerted its control, not only over industry and agriculture, but over the minds of the people themselves. A new word was coined. Brutalist to describe the brutally austere forms of architecture, statuary, and iconography that began to loom over the city streets and village squares like so many hideous gargoyles. Under the stony gaze of these wrathful idols, a kind of national Stockholm Syndrome set in. Wrongful arrests were commonplace, and when arrested, whether wrongfully or not, people were known to praise Stalin and denounce his enemies. Only Stalin! This is the classic definition of a toxic relationship. I honestly can't tell you which is more frightening. 
that these absurd tyrants demanded people love them, or that so many people apparently did. Holy Jesus! What is that? What the fuck is that? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Soviet schools encourage children to spy on their parents and report any counter-revolutionary activities to the proper authorities. In this manner, a new generation of architects, engineers, scientists, teachers, accountants, and supervisors were brought up to replace the old ones. But despite their professional training, they were wholly bereft of anything approaching moral or intellectual courage. These spineless craven drones were not going to tell their bosses that building a bridge with such shoddy materials, for example, might result in catastrophe. Everyone was out to save their own skins all the time, and whenever any building or bridge did collapse, you could always blame it on those pesky counter-revolutionary saboteurs, who existed only in the fevered dreams of the nomenclatura as the only allowable explanation for the repeated failures of their grand socialist project. In the Soviet Union, nobody ever made mistakes because in the Soviet Union, nothing bad ever happened. It, well, except all these things. In 1930, the Soviets embarked on a ruthless policy of exterminating all religions. Russian Orthodox churches were demolished with explosives, priests were put on show trials and publicly beaten, while Buddhist and Muslim adherents were also subjected to horrific persecution. They even set up their own special task force, alternatively called the League of Militant Atheists, or, and I'm not joking, the Society of the Godless. In 1931, the Great Famine begins. We already covered that. In 1932, Stalin's wife kills herself after years of grief. This comes after the son's botched suicide attempt, of which Stalin contemptuously remarked, the boy can't even shoot straight. <laughs> in 1933, the Hall of Demore is in full swing, already covered that too. In 1934, Stalin's crony, Sergei Kirov, was assassinated, prompting Stalin to instigate the first of his many purges. From 1934 to 1936, these purges merge into something called the Great Purge. Stalin expels Communist Party members by the truckload for perceived disloyalty, sticks thousands more in front of kangaroo courts, and condemns them to exile and death. All this is overseen by Stalin's sinister security chief, Genrik Yagoda, until he falls from favor for not being ruthless enough and was himself arrested, executed, and in quintessentially Stalinist style, erased from history. From 1937 to 1938, the Great Purge ramps up to unbelievable heights, as Stalin orders his new security chief, Nikolai Yezov, to arrest upwards of hundreds of thousands of people per month, executing at least half of them. The Great Purge also thinned the ranks of the Red Army, decapitating most of its leadership, including Mikhail Tukhachevsky, hands down Russia's greatest general and military theorist. Other officers, like Konstantin Rokossovsky, were spared, if by spared you mean having only your teeth and fingernails pulled out one by one, which was a good thing since you never know when you might need capable military commanders to, oh, I don't know, defend your fucking country. Speaking of which, in 1939, Stalin shocks the world by signing a non-aggression pact with North Germany, Member of a disbanded giving political Hitler party. a free hand to attack the West, which he shortly does. Also in 1939, Stalin, along with Hitler, invades and ransacks Poland, where he massacres some 20,000 Polish officers and officials in the Katyn Forest. A little later, Stalin seizes territory from Romania, then declares war on Finland of all places. The Finns, surprisingly, hold their ground and inflict terrible casualties on the Red Army, which might have something to do with most of its best officers either having been killed or currently rotting in the Gulag. In 1940, Yezov, Stalin's minister of death, is credibly accused of being a homosexual. So Stalin murders him, erases him from history, and hires an unrepentant pedophile named Laurenti Beria to take his place. You heard that right, a pedophile. And then in 1941, this happens.
Office 6, Stalin continued. If I could pick the worst possible time and place to be born, it would be somewhere around here in the years leading up to the Second World War. To be caught between the Nazi war machine on the one hand and the Soviet steamroller on the other has to be one of the worst fates in all of human history. For nearly four years, the largest, most destructive armies in the history of warfare clashed in a remorseless struggle for the total annihilation of the other. It was a war in which both sides held civilians in utter contempt. To the Germans, they were untermenschen, the subhuman Slavs, who could be plundered and butchered at will. To the Soviets, they were counter-revolutionary traitors, under the egregious reasoning that they had somehow allowed themselves to be overrun and therefore forfeited all claims of protection from the Soviet state. What followed was mechanized human slaughter on a titanic scale. Something like 80 to 90 percent of all German casualties in the war occurred on the Eastern Front. But for every German soldier killed, two Soviet soldiers and between three to five Soviet civilians would perish in a conflagration of hitherto unknown proportions. By the end of the war, 27 million Soviet men, women, and children lay dead. While so many others would endure, dismembered or disfigured, broken physically or psychologically, until the end of their sorrowful days. One particularly chilling facet alone seems to summarize the appalling tragedy of what the Russians called the Great Patriotic War. In the early days of the war, the bumbling Red Army suffered a series of nearly catastrophic defeats. Whole army formations were encircled and millions of men taken prisoner. Now you have to think about this. Imagine how awful life must have been for a common Red Army soldier in the first place. Then imagine how much worse life would become when you are captured by the goddamn Nazis, turned into a slave laborer for four goddamn years, and if you somehow manage not to starve to death, what is your reward for surviving such barbaric treatment? You guessed it, you are arrested and shot. This monster actually ordered the arrest and mass execution of his own prisoners of war, whose only crime were to be badly led by inadequate commanders who only got their jobs because Stalin executed everyone else, and in many cases were forbidden from retreating by Stalin's own ludicrous orders. I suppose this is what my father meant when he used to say the Russians were more Asiatics than they are Europeans. Even the Nazis, as bad as they were, greatly valued the skill and courage of the individual German soldier. To the Soviets, the individual soldier or civilian was nothing, every bit as replaceable as the ammunition boxes delivered to the front on a daily basis. After all, what is 10 or 20 million lives when you have masses and masses of people to recklessly hurl against the gates of hell? That's enough. I, I can't stomach any more of this shit. Thank you for watching. Please visit our internet televisional channel for further video lectures and other essays featuring scantily clad women. Don't forget to leave a like on this video, whatever that means, and also subscribe to the Corset channel. Now available at the low, 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 one-time only price of absolutely and completely free.